Welcome to today's presentation on the Milwaukee Road in Cedar Falls, Washington. Just a couple of administrative notes as we get started. We are recording and streaming today's presentation, so please mute your cell phone. You know, it's a, kind of a standard warning. We'll take a break partway through our program. We can do questions during the break and at the end of the program. For those of you on the stream, you can post questions in the chat. I'll look at those questions, the chat questions during our break and at the end of the program. Let's talk for a moment about the Milwaukee Road and its unique electrification. This was the first railroad that was electrified solely for economic reasons. As the last transcontinental to reach the Pacific, the Milwaukee had at its disposal a vastly different level of technology than the early transcontinental railroads had. The long distances from Midwestern coal supplies and an abundance of hydroelectric power, along with long, severe winters and difficult terrain, all underscored the advantages of electrification. Initially an unmatched technical marvel, it was thought to be the dawn of a technological revolution. That revolution never occurred, despite the operational success of the electrified system. A definitive technological revolution in 1915, it was eventually rendered obsolete by vast advances in electrical engineering. The electrification served where, well, but its inception was primarily a product of the need to overcome problems that did not exist in the same way by the 1970s. Initially, it was prohibitively large sum of private capital to construct, excuse me, given the relatively light density of traffic. Nevertheless, the system had long since paid for itself through years of dependable and almost trouble-free service. The initial electrification in the Rocky Mountains was more successful than, than the Milwaukee frankly anticipated. So authorization was quickly given in 1917 to electrify the Coast Division from Othello to Tacoma and eventually Seattle. By the fall of 1919, electrical helper service was started on several grades. The line to Tacoma was completely electrified by March of 1920 and the last leg into Seattle was completed in 1927. But we all didn't come here to listen to me. We came here to listen to our two special guests, Milwaukee Railroaders that worked in beautiful Cedar Falls, Washington. Let me introduce Alan Miller and Frank Zellerhoff. Welcome, guys. It's great to have you here. Yeah, this is a wonderful opportunity. So let's take a look at, we have a little presentation here, but the point of the presentation is for our guests to be able to share their reminiscences and stories of what it was like in Cedar Falls, because as we know now, Cedar Falls is a ghost town inside the city of Seattle watershed. So we've got a bunch of really, really cool, rare images for you to enjoy today. And I will tell you that the graphics for today's program are part of the Cascade Rail Foundation. Cascade Rail Foundation is one of the members of the Pacific Northwest Railroad Archive. Here is a photo from the Walt Ainsworth Collection on a beautiful summer day in downtown Cedar Falls. And here are a couple of pictures of the substation over the years. We can see, here's a picture of when it was originally constructed. Here is a picture of it from our Cascade Rail Foundation in its later years of operation. And here it is towards the end of its career. In a minute here, Frank's gonna tell us about what all of this stuff did and how that building actually worked. But I just want to take a minute and show you that the Milwaukee Road was really, people thought it was pretty cool. They had these really interesting locomotives. They uh, were electrified. They were, you know, very popular. It was very much ahead of its time. They, they had ski trains that went to Hayek. They did all kinds of cool stuff. I might just, as a spoiler alert, let you know that we're going to be looking at a number of pictures taken by the one and only Richard Steinheimer, a very famous railroad photographer that we were able to graciously get permission to be able to use for today's presentation. And a couple of more pictures of some bipolars. These are all Ashel Curtis photos. And these are in the collection of Cascade Rail Foundation. Alan pointed out to me, prop right there, they were able to extend the life of the trolley pole by a number of years. And Alan, what year do you think this picture was? 
I think that might be in the in the late 40s, maybe early 50s. In, would be in, my in, guess. In, in, and how do you form that? You know, what cues do you see here that help us see that? Well, the, the motors, which are the electric engines, are in solid black still. Later, they were painted in an orange and black scheme. I believe in the beginning in the mid or late 50s. So this would tell me that this predates that change there. Uh, they still have the service tank up, which means that the uh, Everett line and Inclaw line locomotives are still probably steam. So they need to come in and get fuel from that tank. So, so that kind of puts everything prior to 1950 or so. Okay, let's look at some more pictures. Now, here's a map, and actually, Alan, I'm glad that you're here to show, to explain this. This map is courtesy of Alan, by the way, as a number of these images are. I'm very grateful for it. Is that where the depot is? Yeah. Okay, about in here somewhere? Yeah. And then the substation was about here? Right there, exactly, yep. Okay, and then these were the bungalows? Yeah, the three substation bungalows, and then there was other and company then, houses there. And then the, the beanery, the diner, was behind this too. It was a beanery and a hotel. A hotel. And then one of the things I learned today about these bungalows, we'll look at them here in more detail in a minute, is that both of these guys lived in the same bungalow at one point in time. So we'll get a chance to, to talk about that. You know, they worked together, they worked together at Cedar Falls, but Frank and Alan never met each other till today. So, so I'm glad it didn't turn out to be like Jerry Springer or something. So here's the substation, and we can see here, these are the bungalows behind there. Now, which one of these did you guys live in? The middle one. The middle one. How about that? And then Alan ended up with the bathtub, didn't you? Yeah. You want to clarify the fact that we didn't live there together. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good point these days. We've Thanks, never guys. met before today. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, they, they worked. At, they were at Cedar Falls at the same time, but... Frank was in the substation and Alan was in the depot, so they were doing different we had, things. We had heat, uh, we had uh, shovel coal for a coal furnace to heat the houses, and I put uh, oil burner, two of those, two of those houses and a couple of them at Hayek. So Frank, I want you to start talking now, we're gonna start talking about the substation folks and how the substation worked. So Frank, I want you to explain what's going on here and what these series of items here did. So Frank, take it away. Well, the uh, metal tower that you see there is, uh, that's uh, the wires uh, heading east up to Hayek, and uh, that's 115,000 volts, so you might read or hear that uh, 100,000, but it was up to, up to 115,000 just before prior to my tenure, which started in 69. And then those uh, silver, uh, uh, what they look like, uh, cans there uh, with the... Uh, uh, These right here? The, yeah, with the black uh, stacks there. Those are, those, those are insulators or bushings. And uh, so that's a three-phase, 115,000 volts. And like I say, it's going up to Hayek. And, and that goes all the way to uh, uh, Othello. Uh, and it feeds, it connects with Washington water power, and this, this end, uh, uh, well, it doesn't show in this picture, but the other, other end of the substation over there is where the, over yeah, back, back over in there is another uh, 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 structure, and that has uh, 115,000 volts, which comes from Snoqualmie Falls. And Snoqualmie Falls is kind of interesting because originally the Milwaukee Railroad was going to build uh, the electrified system uh, to generate electricity there at Snoqualmie Falls, but they were financially uh, unable to put it together. So the city of Seattle did it, and they entered into a, a lucrative uh, uh, rate with the Milwaukee Railroad to uh, use that power to run the train. Okay. Now explain to me what... Well, now you're looking at the DC side. Okay, so it comes so, uh, in as AC, goes have, out as DC, okay? You have two different circuits up there now. You got a 4,400 volt circuit, which is a lower circuit. Uh, not, not over there, yeah, it's just stay right up there. Okay. On that rack, and uh, 
So two of those, uh, uh, probably the outboard ones, are for the signal circuit, which is 4,400. And, uh, and that fed the signals. And, and you could get burned pretty good on that. We had a lineman at one time get hit. Uh, and fortunately, he got hit on the right hand. And it went, went down to the right side of his body and blew a hole in his toe, so he didn't, he didn't uh, die. But uh, the other three the larger ones there are, are uh, the DC circuits. Uh, so that's uh, up to 3,400 volts DC and 3,400 amps. And that, that can make your hair stand up. Yeah, we'll talk about some of those hair-raising experiences inside the substation. So, and the reason it's set up like that is because down in, which you might see later on, in the office here, you had uh, three levers where you could control electricity to the west uh, towards uh, Maple Valley. Uh, or to, uh, towards Hayek, uh, or the, you could tie the two together to have a run through circuit, so to speak. Okay, so let's look at this. So this one might go to the west, and this one might go to the east, and then when you connected these, the whole thing would flow as one continuous that's circuit, correct. Then, right? So that's correct. Okay, all right. So now we're inside the substation. Now, okay, so what's this thing? That's a picture out of Frankenstein. <laughs> so what you have there, that's a lightning arrestor. So if lightning uh, uh, came into the substation, uh, it could be, the, with the lo with the, if the load was greater, say, than the 115,000 volts that would be normal, it would spin off that extra voltage onto this stacks of insulators and ground connections and it would eventually wear the, the power out of the lightning by the time it got to the bottom, hopefully. Because what happened in Montana, didn't it not work one time in Montana? Oh, well, in Montana, uh, uh, it did get into the substation that blew up the transformer. Uh, so that transformer is transforming the 115,000 volts to the, uh, to the uh, 30, let's see, 4,300 volts or something like that. Okay, okay. so okay, speaking uh, of transformers, is that yeah. what we've got uh, going on here then, Frank? Those, those uh, cans there are oil circuit breakers, and, and right, that's the transformer right there. This is the transformer. Uh, and that's a, a temperature gauge on the transformer right, right there. Here. Okay. And so that... Uh, just give him the stick, folks, and he can just show us. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, these are standoff bushings here. Uh, and inside here is... Uh, uh, like um, I'd see on a on an excavator or a backhoe, where it has uh, uh, a toe and a foot, where that comes together, where the, where it can pick up the dirt like this. So the electricity was connected like that, and these these cans were filled with uh, um, trans was called transformer oil, and uh, uh, every so often. Uh, it, uh, yearly, uh, or uh, kind of dependent probably on, on operations, uh, they, you had to drain the uh, oil out of here and, and filter it, run it through press filters and uh, uh, to get any carbon out of the oil because if it got too much carbon in it, then it could go to ground and blow a hole right through the can. So it would uh, conduct they, electricity uh, in other words? That had to be really done correctly. And when you got through filtering the oil, if you thought it was good enough, then you put some of that oil into like a uh, really fancy uh, coffee cup. Only this coffee cup had two pins that went through it. And, uh, and then you could put that on a, plug that into a wall socket and see if you could draw an arc through that oil. If you could draw an arc through that oil, it wasn't filtered well enough and you had to filter it some more. If it got no arc in it, then you could put the oil back in the tank and, and re-energize it. So then, what are, what are these up here then, Frank? Well, that's the hundred, that's the, up on the ceiling there, 
The one's up in the ceiling, yeah. This one's here? So that's bringing 115,000 volts in, and, um, and that is going into the transformer, and then it's, yeah, and then it's coming out of the transformer and going to this outside lead of the switch, and uh, then the, uh, when you, uh, inside the substation, which we'll show later, when they, when you, if you turn on the starting switch, it closes the contact here, and, um, and it uh, then starts the AC motor that turns the two 1500 amp generators. So, so what do we got here, Frank? Oh, well, there's your transformer. Again, there's the nitrogen tanks there. Those, that was, uh, those tanks there were to uh, eliminate any oxygen that might be in that transformer because you needed oxygen to create a fire or an explosion. So by keeping the oxygen out of the transformer um, uh, was very important. And so then in, in, uh, I don't know exactly how that arrangement there is. I think that might be in a Cleom. I don't know what's yeah. talking about that. But down underneath here, down this thing here, this uh, and right over there, that goes down into like a basement. And down underneath there is uh, underneath here is a yeah. Basement. There are two. Uh, in this case, since there was uh, this was a two mg set substation. If it had been three. MG sets, then you'd have three, three of those uh, spaces. And down below there were, um, I, I think they were like uh, 500 gallon uh, holding tanks that when you drained the oil out of the transformer, you drained it down into that holding tank. And that's what you pumped out through this press filter and, and round and round and round. Like, so when you had to work inside there, which uh, yeah, uh, was tell pretty me more. interesting. So you'd, you'd turn off the power, you'd disconnect, yeah, you'd open up the circuit breakers, disconnects, and then you open the manhole, say the, 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 day, the, day, yeah, the day before, and uh, so that it could cool down. And then uh, you drain, drain the oil out, well you had to drain the oil out, and then you climbed in there, and you put a ladder up there, and you had to secure the ladder, and, and then we uh, had to use a garden hose and an extension cord. So we had the extension cord, of course, for power so we could see, and the garden hose was so you could breathe through it. You would want to take a couple of whiffs through the garden hose. Ellen and I would love that today. Oh, they? yeah, I, yeah, this is all so, pre-OSHA, folks. So it was still quite warm. And uh, the chief uh, maintenance guy was uh, a pretty thin fellow. He was only about five foot four or so. Uh, Joe Yankapal was his name. So he'd go up the ladder and he'd just go down like a monkey, you know. And then uh, we had another guy that stood out, stayed outside to give us uh, insulating tape. So the reason for going in there was that uh, the uh, bands around the metal plates in there uh, were, would get loose and they would vibrate. If you went by, you may still go by some electrical device that you might hear something vibrating and that's what that is. So the, in order to keep from get, getting to an arc in there, that we had to go in there and tape those plates together. And it was really, really important. So I'm, I go down in there and I'm working down there and I, I can't deal with it. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm getting claustrophobia, and I got to get my butt out of there before somebody has to try to pull me out. So I can't get my shoulders out. Then eventually, eventually I did get out, and the guy that was working down here, he went in, and I, I took care of him with the rags and whatnot, too. But it was pretty interesting. And then when, once the oil was purified, then it was pumped back in there, and, uh, and then you had to open the nitrogen to force the oxygen out and then seal the lid on the top and, uh, and turn the power on and hopefully it was all okay. <laughs> yeah, everything went okay. Since, since how long I, did you have to do that maintenance? How, long, how many, like every few months, once a year? When, when did you have to do this kind of maintenance?
how often did you have to climb, someone have to climb in there? Well, uh, like I say, I started in 69 and I left there in 74. Uh, so we didn't have, uh, well, I'd say 72, I had the most operation, maybe uh, three trains in a week. And so it wasn't like it was when you, uh, when the bipolars were going to Hayek, or, you know, it wasn't like we had maybe three electric trains going at the same time. So you didn't have the usage uh, in the time that I was there. So I was only involved in doing that, I would say, about three times. When I, I started out as an electrician's helper, uh, and I worked at uh, every one, almost every one of the substations for a couple of months before I became an operator. But um, it, oh, gosh. So how does this? So how does this thing work? This is like a Ouija board, isn't it? <laughs> how do you use this to get a train up and down the hill from, let's say, Cedar Falls up to Hayek? So this is all DC stuff. So this uh, board right here with all of the, the small switches on it and the fuses, uh, that's what uh, powered the, the beanery and uh, uh, Allen's house and the, the rest of the houses uh, up there. And uh, the ones on the very end here, those two there, that was a 4,400 volts for the signal uh, circuit. These ones down here? Yeah, right. Okay, I got that right. Look, folks, I got it right. And uh, then this uh, here, these two right here, uh, the lower two were uh, for starting uh, or for closing the uh, power from the MG sets out to the trolley. The MG sets being above, motor you generators. See, you can't see what's up above, but uh, those, those uh, what looks like boards sticking out there, those were called arc chutes. So if you had an arc off of the connection, it would shoot them up to the ceiling. So it didn't hit, come down and hit you. <laughs> and, and by the way, you work, that's a rubber mat down here. And under certain, you always, you never wore a watch and you never wore your wedding ring. It was the only time I ever took my wedding ring off. Yeah. But, uh, so yeah, so then you've got those dials there. Uh, no, no, that, those are gauge right here. Right, no, those circle, there you, no, no. Little round things, but there you go, there you go. Yay. So then those were to balance the power on regeneration. It was very, very important to, to keep, like if you had a thousand uh, amps of uh, coming into the substation from G regeneration, you had to make sure that each machine only got 500. If one of the machines got out of balance and maybe get 700, it would very quickly steal everything and, and it could overload its circuit and trip it out of the system. And then all of a sudden you got everything on the other machine and then, then you got track tripped out, now you got nothing. And so you hopefully the train's got enough battery to run the air brakes. So you got to get, you had like uh, 15 or 20 seconds to get back online and hopefully everything was okay. Sometimes when the train came out of uh, the tunnel going west, they would kind of drift out of the tunnel and then they'd go into regeneration. Uh, he'd bunch up his train, you know, so the, all the couplings were real nice and tight. And then he might, uh, the hoghead, the hoghead was the engineer, the engineer might uh, feel that he wanted to speed up a little bit, so he'd, he'd, he'd take power and so you, now you're, he's taking power from you, then all of a sudden he realizes maybe that he's going maybe a little bit too fast uh, for because of the, like you saw that long bridge there, uh, or Rockdale or some of these places where we have a lot of slides. Uh, and so he might choke it up. So the electricity can be, kind of look like this that he's using. And that's all up in that, up in those meters there. These? Uh, yeah, yeah, the bigger ones. These? Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's all inked. That's all stored in an ink graph, which comes very important later on. Anyway, they, uh, ideally, when you had to get back online, if you got it over the circuit, he was in uh, 
a, you know, a kind of a, a, a move ahead or, or, or a non-use mode so that you could get started and then bring the power up to them or take, pull the power down to them. It was, it was like a yo-yo, so to speak. <laughs> Any case, the system worked good. This, this graph thing, you'll hear more about that later on because uh, I don't know if that's something you want to get into right yeah, now. Well, we can talk about it for a second. Yeah, we, 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 haven't, we didn't actually find a copy of the graph for today's presentation, but why not just talk about it right now, Frank? Keep going. There were times, mostly on uh, uh, eastbound trains, eastbound trains coming out of Cedar Falls, uh, uh, they would maybe get a running start from, the, from his office. Uh, and uh, they would probably start out pulling about 2,000 amps. And then uh, get past the substation uh, going up to uh, Ragnar, uh, they would uh, be pulling, they could even pull 3,000. But when he was coming out of the hole, which we called it, uh, to go up the hill, to get a run at going up the hill, well, uh, I would contact the operator at Hayek and have him come on at 3,400. So his line loss, the 20 miles or 30 miles of, of wire coming down, he'd have line loss in there, so he'd really only be providing the train maybe uh, 3,200 volts. And I would be at 3,200. I could, did not dare go over 3,200 for when he wanted to accelerate, because he would just overload me and trip me out, and he'd be dead in the water. and and impossible to get started again. He'd have to coast all the way back down and into his office and get an, maybe t reduce the tonnage. So the deal was, the first thing the conductor would say, hey, the operator wasn't providing us enough power to make the hill. So I said, wait a minute. So then I get this graft out there and I send it into the office and I say, here's, here's the graft. So the problem is the conductor didn't know how to make add the tonnage that he picked up at Cedar Falls. So his way, instead of being 3,000 ton, he was like 3,600 ton. And that made a huge difference in these box cabs. But, so that gave you a little rundown pretty quick. So then, Frank, th this is handling 115,000 volts coming in and 3,000 volts DC going out. It wasn't the back of this panel open? Uh, the back of the panel is all DC. Okay. There's no AC back there. It's all DC, and it's all open. And uh, you don't want to get too close, do you? We had a couple guys get fried back there uh, in Montana, but and all there was a safety line was a yellow uh, rope with a little sign on it, a little lightning sign on it. High voltage. So you had to be. Uh, you didn't crawl on your hands and knees back there. So explain to us what this is, and let's start with this end, and, and we've got kind of two halves of the same picture here, but you know, back in the day with fixed focal length lenses, you needed two pictures to capture the whole scene. So starting over here, what's this? Well, this is uh, uh, General Electric, GE, uh, and the reason I say that is because some of them were Westinghouse, and so in the very, in the, in the center one there with the holes around it, that's the AC motor, uh, and uh, each one on the end is uh, DC generator, 1500 amp DC generator on each end. Actually, we, we bumped them up uh, to uh, uh, 1600, 1600 amps by shimming the coils. And so those are bearing blocks in the center there. Uh, and those little vertical things that you see right in the center, that's uh, oil, no, no, keep going with your stick. Right up, straight up, straight up, not too fast. Right there, right there. <laughs> that's a, a glass thing that shows you the bearing oil level. And uh, those are lead Babbitt bearings. Uh, so uh, um, uh, heat was a big thing. Uh, you should see at the temperature gauge there. No, that's on the switchboard, on, right on the machine, on the AC motor there. Someplace there might be a. So I, I kept one of those things that's in my basement. Oh, okay. <laughs> so then what's the difference between oh. this end and this end? Well, let's go back over here to the square one because that's uh, pretty important. 
All right. So you, what do we I'm got? I'm sure all of you folks know what circuit breakers are in your house, and you have a, a 15 amp circuit breakers for your light switches, and a 20 amp circuit breakers for your plugins, and you might have a 30 amp or even a 50 amp circuit breaker for your washer, for your dryer, and and uh, your stove. Well, that that's a that's a 3,500 amp circuit breaker. And the reason it's built like that is the circuit breaker is in the lower box. And that portion up above, that square, that what looks like a piece of plywood up above is masonite. And that's called an arc chute. So if the, if you, if the train wrecked or if the power line came down and went to ground and it short-circuited that 3,400 volt or 3,400 amp, service that you were given to that train, you would trip that breaker like the breaker in your house. You would see a spark in the breaker in your house. Like if you pulled a, a, a plug out, if you were running a skill saw, instead of turning the switch off, you pulled the plug out of the wall, you're gonna draw an arc. So the arc that comes out of there can go two stories high in that building. And if that, if that got, if a train Let's say uh, the weather was really, really bad, so uh, maybe uh, uh, w trees were blowing into the wires once in a while, or it could shut off the power at your house, you know? And uh, so if that, if you got right back online again, and, you, and all of a sudden you went back out again, that circuit breaker could electronically controlled, could only function about twice without overheating the little control button. So you had to try to energize it by hand. If you want to find a way to wet your pants or crap your pants, that's how you do it. So right down in the bottom here, way down, way, keep going, keep going, keep. See that little thing sticking out the side at the bottom? No, on, right there. So right there is a hole about a little bit larger than a baseball bat, but not a lot, much big larger. And the reason was because you had to take a baseball bat and stick it in there and try to close that circuit. And you had to keep your head below that. So you, lay, you, you kneeled down there or you laid down there. And, and that spring was about that tall and it's like a spring in a railroad car. Only instead of being a round coil, it was a square coil. And, it, and I discovered when I took it apart that it was pretty high in gold, pretty high value of gold. But you had to lay down there and try to close that. And if it was still going to ground, it was <laughs> and you didn't make it. <laughs> you maybe went to, maybe you had to go to the head to change your pants. But it was a pretty, pretty tricky deal, but it really, uh, I only had to do it once. Uh, I practiced doing it without any electricity going. I practiced how I would, could get uh, uh, in a good position to close that thing. It was pretty interesting, but uh, I took that one apart. I wanted to see how, when, it, when we shut down uh, and they kept, I stayed on for about six months dismantling some of the stuff. And that was the first thing I dismantled because I wanted to see how the hell that thing was built. <laughs> so here we have another picture of a motor generator unit. And is that a Westinghouse? It might be, I'm not sure. And then what is the thing here on the far right, Frank? Well, let's see, you had, uh, oh, oh, yeah, that's, uh, uh, <laughs> you got Because you me. painted it with that special paint, right? I know what that is. I just can't call it up. When you're 84, you can figure that out. I'm sure some of you guys might be that age. I don't know. Uh, statter. That's the statter. So that, it, and the other end is uh, something similar, but maybe a little bit different side, and that's the exciter. And that is to help, uh, to help boost electricity uh, uh, from the commutator, which is uh, the big end uh, by the cage there. And here we have a substation operator. Now, is this where your desk was, Frank? Yeah, that's the substation. All right, so you... There's a number, that was the number four phone. Uh, well, that was a city phone. And then down on the side here, 
you had a phone and a, and a crank. So like Cedar Falls was two shorts and a long or some damn thing, I can't, I, I can't even remember, it's hard to say. Uh, so with that, I would uh, maybe rattle uh, Alan's cage down at the depot to find out if he could tell me uh, when the train might be getting ready to head out of there. Uh, and then I had uh, another phone that was just used by the substation operators. It was a number four phone. Uh, and then uh, in front of this guy was a phone, a microphone that would come out like this, and that was the train dispatcher, and uh, Alan knows all about that stuff. Yeah, that, uh, I that was them, a scissors. We I call it a scissors phone. with the dispatcher, but really quickly, you see those white posts? One, two, and you can't hardly, the third one is over here. Those were the posts that controlled the switches up on the very first picture that he showed you, the, the DC connections. So that if you had a train, if you had a train between uh, Cedar Falls and Hayek and it was going uphill, he was going to demand a lot of power. And if you had another train that was just going down to Tacoma, he, they didn't need much. So I would start renting by remote control and I would disconnect. I would open this circuit so he couldn't take any power from me so that I could run the train up the hill. And then when that was all done, then I would open those two circuits and close this one in the middle, and that connected everybody together. So that's how, that's how we could run two or three trains at one time without uh, overloading the system. So here's another picture of the substation. This is getting kind of towards the end of its career, isn't it? Yeah, but you, the important thing that you have here, way over in the corner, that, that's that guy right there, that's uh, 115,000 volts coming from Snoqualmie Falls. And uh, that is a rack up there that has uh, uh, six bushings on it. Bushings are what, well, you could call insulators. They're standing up like this. And they, you can see they're spread apart. and. Uh, they're down, you would barely see a silver pole going down the side of that telephone pole. And down at the bottom, there's a, a 90 degree uh, crank, much like a switch on a railroad switch. And so uh, when you wanted to, if you had to work on, if, it, if the crews had to work on the wires or if there was a, a, sh a short circuit from that end, then you had to, uh, open up that that power up there, and uh, what you did first, there's a uh, you had to open up a oil circuit breaker, which was those silver cans in the fir very first picture. You'd opened up what's called the west side, and that would be the west side. And once you disconnected that, open the oil circuit breaker because you you could break that power inside those cans with those with that transformer oil. It snuffed out the power, snuffed out the arc. But if you try to open that thing up without opening that oil circuit breaker, the arc would be all the way, it would burn the whole top off of that, off of those. So you can see that's pretty flimsy. And the wind would come out of the southwest in the wintertime and would wiggle that rack around. And then when you had to operate that switch, opening it wasn't quite a bad, you know, you might draw an arc about well, maybe a foot was no big deal. Uh, and then you've got the switch open like so. So it's a big blade thing like this on the, that's going up and like this. And then on top of the insulator there, there's a, a V thing like this. And the, the trick is to get this, this V, this piece of metal, go, to go in to make the connection. So you stood down at the bottom, and then you try to close it. And it, Sometimes it, the blade would go on the outside of the V, and then you had to reopen it, and then you'd draw an arc in again when you reopen it. And so you had to get a hold of this thing and just go whack, and hopefully it went in the center. And so once it made it in the center, then you were all connected, and then you could close this oil circuit breaker, and you had power back into the substation and back down to the, to the beanery and, and uh, and up to Hayek, and, and all the way to Othello. 
So Excellent. That, but that was really important stuff. So here are a couple of pictures of the beanery. And this was sort of a famous place. These pictures are by a very famous photographer, Blair Koistra, who graciously allowed us to use these images in today's presentation. And we also have, here's another picture of Blair. And Alan, isn't this Rattlesnake Lake here in the background? Yep, and that's Rattlesnake Ridge up there. Rattlesnake Ridge up there too. And we'll talk about Rattlesnake Lake and how it came to be in the second half of our program. Very famous photograph uh, by Richard Steinheimer of the beanery with the deer, and then Blair got a picture with the train going up the Everett branch towards Everett. I'm gonna interrupt you. Yeah, go ahead, Frank. So the deer that you just saw, so I had uh, three children, and a son and two daughters, and my eldest daughter was just a real animal lover. She loved rabbits and maybe even snakes, I don't know, but I have some photographs of her coming down, bringing me breakfast down to the substation with her arm around a fawn like this, walking down to the substation. <laughs> it's just really fabulous. Here's a picture. These are inside of the beanery. These are taken by uh, Richard Steinheimer. Uh, pictures inside. Would this be the dining room and then this would be one of the hotel rooms, Alan, do you think? Yeah, or? I think so. The reason for this building is to house the uh, train crews and to feed them, especially in the winter when they had uh, uh, rotary snow trains out of Cedar Falls, they had to go up and plow snow over the pass. But uh, you had uh, various work trains and locals out of here, and so they had this uh, bunkhouse ba basically as a, as a trainman's hotel and then a, a, a beanery in there to feed the crews when they, before they went on duty and also when they come off duty. Yeah, so we got a couple of pictures of it here. Here's, um, is that Tom Stosser? No, I think he's, I think that's a cook. That that's a cook? That. Okay. I, well, I, I believe so, yeah. <laughs> Spoiler alert, I got a caption wrong. Oh, because I thought it was Tom Strasser. You can see him with the locals. And then you can see him with the locals. <laughs> And I believe the picture on the right actually made it into the Seattle Times at one point. Um, a very famous picture by Richard Steinheimer. These were in his book, and we were able to ha help from the Center for Railroad Photography and Art in Madison, Wisconsin, to be able to use these images in today's program. And then this is what it looked like in later years. Now, which one of you guys' kids used to play house in here? That was mine. My two daughters would go down here and play house in this. It was all abandoned. And my oldest daughter had names for all the rooms. This, this is John's room. He's kind of messy. And this is Bill's room. And, but they'd go down here and play, play house all the time and, and stuff in this building. And there was a lot of, as you can see, a lot of dishes and things left behind. So they <laughs> utilized that stuff, had fun down there playing. When they finally tore this building down. We found out it was housing about a thousand bats up in the attic and about 500 of them moved into my house and about 500 moved into my neighbor's house. Yeah. Well, so yeah. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of my story there. So Virginia Golf, a lady named Virginia Golf, and Still living, by the way. For the life of me, I can't think of her husband's name right now, but they, were, they, they ran the beanery and uh, until uh, I left there, or um, probably just before, yeah, until I left there, because they, they went to Alaska just before I left. But uh, my wife used to come down and help Virginia uh, feed, uh, especially uh, the crew that was going on the Everett run, or uh, if we had, a, uh, sometimes if you had a train that couldn't make it up the hill and they had to back down, uh, they couldn't uh, finish the job in their hours of service, so they would spend the night there. And, uh, and Nancy would help Virginia fix meal, breakfast, and so forth. And, and, uh, and uh, Bagley Junction, or the crew that went to Bagley Junction, or went to, uh, well, came down, well, Maple Valley? No, they didn't come to Bagley, Maple Valley. Where the hell did they go that? Enumclaw. Enumclaw. From Cedar Falls to... That was, that was the Enumclaw job. They'd come up to Bagley Junction and then come up to Cedar Falls. Yeah, well, it never used to be a Cedar Falls job, though. Oh, yeah, it was. Yeah, 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 it was. They'd come up and, uh, and they'd uh, go to Bagley Junction. And then they'd spend the night sometimes. Anyway, we used to play pinochle and... and uh, oh, and they'd go fishing. 
the fishing there on the lake was great because it wasn't open to the public at that time. And you know how they packed the fish home? They took the pillowcases off and filled them with fish. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my. Very good. Yeah, I hate, I'm sorry to see the nest there. Yeah, oh, yeah. No, that's a shame. Here's a, a Blair Cloister picture that kind of gives us, the, sets the scene for us, as it were, because we can see a westbound train. This is in the diesel era now, with the substation still standing, the beanery, and then this was the line that went up to the Everett branch. So that gives us just kind of a, an idea of what we've got there. And then here's a couple of Blair Coistra photos that, again, show the, the bungalows, which, um, you know, were quite, quite famous. Alan, the bungalows were for, for substation crews or for train crews? Or who, who were those bungalows for? Well, they were originally built for the uh, substation. The, the substation ran 24-7, so yeah. you had three uh, shifts of operators working at the substation and so one house for each one of those guys and his family. And so that was the original use of them. But by my time, uh, the substation had been closed and they just rented them out to any employee. So the sec section man lived in the closest one and I lived in the second one. Another operator rented the third one, but he never lived up there. He worked caught up in Bellingham, but he he kept the house in case they put another job on it. Cedar, he'd come, come back down there and work again. But, and then there was several other houses because at one time the roadmaster had a house here, the agent had a house here, the telegraph operators, the roadmaster's clerk, the section foreman, the uh, signal maintainer, and, uh, and, the, li and the lineman all had houses here in this community. Yeah, it was quite a community at one time. It was, uh, we had a pretty nice community, really, you know. Uh, when, uh, at my, once again, in 69, uh, the, every substation only had one operator, and, uh, and then they would juggle your, uh, your schedule around. I mean, one, one week you might work uh, um, four to, uh, or eight to four, and another week you might work midnight to eight, or you just didn't, you, you worked, uh, we worked like, uh, uh, we had like uh, 14 day weeks, 14 or 13 day weeks, yeah, you worked 13 days and you got two, two days off. And uh, every uh, third month you got a four day weekend or something like that. Uh, but many times uh, we were on 24 hour, uh, you had, if you got a call, you get like a, the, uh, the train dispatcher would uh, let a whole tell, tell the uh, electrical head office there in Tacoma say, hey, we need, a, we need power down at the roundhouse at 3 o'clock in the morning. And then, then uh, the superintendent of electrical would contact the substation operator and say, hey, Frank, you got to be on duty at 3 o'clock in the morning and provide power. So, but we... Uh, we had great, uh, uh, really great family connections. Uh, uh, the wives really uh, pooled together, getting the kids down to school. Um, I have to say, uh, uh, I had been in business for myself for several years uh, prior to this. Uh, uh, and I got out of high school in 57 and I went into business right away because I couldn't afford to go to college. And, and, and then it was a 24 hour, I'd, eight day a week thing too. So going to a substation was nothing new for me for time wise, but uh, the camaraderie uh, between the uh, uh, communications guys uh, and, uh, and the signal maintainers and the car knockers, which the uh, car knocker is a guy that repairs cars and he lived in the farthest house and I was in the house that, that Alan eventually uh, came in and then a relief agent was in the first house, but it was, it was nice. Let's take a look at this picture and tell us what we have here. Why does it say Moncton instead of Cedar Falls? Well, this is what became Cedar Falls, but uh, when the railroad built through here, they named this station Moncton for reasons unknown. Uh, there is a Moncton up in New Brunswick, 
Canada, I believe, so maybe there was a Canadian on the survey crew, who knows, but, uh, but this was the original depot in the center of the building there. And then you have your semaphore train order signal. Uh, those blades would notify trains if they had to stop there to pick up further orders. And then you got the water tank there. Now, this water tank didn't have a spout on it. This water tank fed a couple of, uh, of uh, water columns that stood along the tracks and they get the water that way. Uh, this was a helper point at this point in the railroad's uh, existence. This was the beginning of the mountain grade up Snoqualmie Pass. So you had trains would stop here and get a helper locomotive put on them. So you had to have facilities to, to run those engines. So what you have here on the far is a, the coaling tower that held coal in there for the engines and then water from the water tank. So, so and then you can see there's a outhouse there, a men and women's double outhouse for the employees. This little board and batten building over here, that was the express shed. You can see the Wells Fargo diamond sign there on the corner of it. And then uh, you can see all the, the telegraphers are all out there hamming it up on the baggage cart. So, so what, what are the keys to help us identify what year this picture was taken and what year was this picture taken? Uh, this picture was taken uh, about 19... 10, I believe, and uh, the, the, the station was changed to Cedar Falls in 1912, so we know it's prior to that. And, uh, but otherwise, this, this scene pretty much stayed the same from 1909 when this depot was opened up until they built the new depot in 1911. So, so whose idea was it to change it from Moncton to Cedar Falls? Actually, it was the city of Seattle uh, was already established up here, and uh, they had called their power plant up here the Cedar Falls plant because it was on the Cedar River, and there was a, a waterfalls just up from it. And so they wanted the railroad to change the name to Cedar Falls, and the railroad did not like, they had a criteria for station names, and they didn't like two word names, they liked the single word names. And then they didn't like names that could be confused with other nearby stations. And uh, down on the Pacific Coast Railroad out, out of Maple Valley here was a station called Cedar Mountain. So there was a potential to mistake those two stations when you're shipping freight and stuff like that. And so they didn't want to change it. They kind of resisted the city of Seattle to do that. But the city of Seattle turned around and made them an offer that they couldn't refuse. And that offer was that they would supply electricity to the depot and the little railroad community that was here. And then they also would provide new signs for the depot that had the word Cedar Falls spelled out in, in light bulbs. You mean like this? Like that, exactly. Pretty close to that, yeah. Yeah, it, now we, we think what year would this be about then? This would be uh, about 1912. Okay. Uh, or 13, somewhere in that area. Well, maybe a little later, because th this one has the modified sign. See, it says plant number one, the municipal light and power system of Seattle, America's best lighted city, 40 miles. Uh, I have a 1912 picture that shows that sign in a simpler form. So at some point, I'm guessing that because this is plant number one, maybe the Ross Dam or something was plant number two. So maybe this sign was modified after that was put in. I don't know. But. So quickly then, explain how these, these train order signals worked and how I knew which one was for me. OK, the, it, the blade that would govern the train is the one that's on the right as you're approaching it. So that would be that one. And the color of that blade would be red with a white stripe on it. The other blade is white with a black stripe, and that applies to westbound trains. And the, those levers uh, that control those blades were controlled from floor levers inside the depot, like almost like an interlocking plant. And you'd grab the lever and you'd 
throw it one way or the other. And those, those blades at this time only had two positions. Uh, this is stop for orders. And then if the blade was straight up, that was clear. There was a 45 degree angle that uh, they, they put in later when they uh, went to the 19 form train orders. It could be hooped up as the train went by and they wouldn't have to stop. So here's some pictures of it a little bit later. This would be about in your era, wouldn't it be? Yeah. Uh, Is that your truck? <laughs> I always got to ask. <laughs> Yeah, that, that top one there is a little before my time because it's still got the semaphore style train order signal. And uh, that, that happened to break uh, w one day when the operators went to throw it. In fact, I think it was Marty Kester. And uh, he would just squeeze the lever and let gravity do the let rest and he'd just let it go. And that semaphore would slam down while well, he did it one too many times and it shattered. And uh, it come crashing down off the thing and they sent for Andy Brettschneider. He was the signal maintainer and he went in and looked at it and he got a hold of the, his supervisor and says, I can't fix this, it's beyond repair. You're gonna have to get a new signal. So they bought a color light signal, which is almost like a traffic light signal. It has the three lenses for green, yellow, and red. So we can kind of tell the different years then because of the, how this uh, train order signal evolved over time. Yeah, I believe that signal broke in 71. So okay. that would be prior to 71. This would be after 71. And we had a famous movie in Cedar Falls. Tell us a little bit about this, Alan. Yeah, just about the time I was moving out of my house up there, they, uh, they showed up and they gave the depot a new coat of paint on the front of it. And, and hung this Victor Wyoming sign on there and, and fixed it all up. In fact, you can see that the interior is all completed. They never did any interior uh, shots that made it into the movie, but uh, I went up there and was looking through the window and there was a teletype in there that was better than the one that we had when the railroad was running and that teletype was operating. It was spitting out all kinds of stuff. So they went to great lengths to to create a, a railroad office in there that never really got seen in the movie. But anyway, John Belushi and, uh, and uh, I can't. Blair Brown, it looks Blair like. Brown, yeah, yeah. This, was a, this was a Hollywood classic if there ever was one, right? And, uh, yeah. And uh, anyway, they filmed this movie up there. And we went out and asked these guys when they were fixing the depot all up and they even brought a load of ballast up there and laid it out along the main line to make the main line look nicer. And uh, we asked them, you know, what are you guys doing? Well, we're just a group that goes around and fixes stuff. And I, yeah, yeah, okay. Right. <laughs> Where were you when the railroad was running? <laughs> <laughs> and the, of course, the, the rails were all rusty by that point in time. So they took a three inch roller and some silver paint and they painted the tops of the rails but they messed up because where the switches were, they also painted the guardrails silver and stuff, which should have been left rusted. And then uh, the car department building over there, they painted a big beech nut tobacco sign on the end of it. And, and that got left behind. And I always wondered about people driving up and visiting Cedar Falls in later years after the railroad was gone and wandered into the where the yard was and they'd see that, oh my, look at that old beech nut tobacco sign. That must be decades old. <laughs> so, but this is inside the city of uh, Seattle watershed, isn't it, Alan? Yeah. So not many people can go in there and, and, and didn't you have a problem with the city of Seattle when you were at work once? Well, I wasn't really at work. It was on, a, on, my, on my day off on a Sunday and I was down at the the far end of the yard, the west end of the yard, I discovered that the main line had uh, uh, date nails still in its highs that were dated clear back to 1927. So I went down there to get, get some date nails out of those ties. So I was down there prying date nails out and one of the watershed Nazis spotted me and come up there and says, uh, what are you doing? I says, Harvesting date nails. He said, well, you can't be in here. And I says, yeah, I can. 
no, no, you can't be on this property. And I said, well, I work for the railroad. I come down here every night and check the yard. Well, you're within the confines of the Seattle watershed. I said, no, I'm on the railroad tracks. The railroad owns all this. You can't be down here. The only time you can be down here is during your duty, when you're doing your duty and stuff. And so he ran me off and threatened to, to get a King County Sheriff up there to arrest me if I didn't leave. So I left, but after that, when I'd have to go down there and check the yard in the middle of the night, just for him, at whatever point I was closest to the Cedar River, I would unzip my fly and take a piss. <laughs> I had my run-ins. I had my run-ins with those fellas too, but what most, happened? Most of it was my fault because I tried to sneak up to Chester Morris Lake because there's always such great fishing up there. And uh, especially when uh, every once in a while the University of Washington fisheries people would uh, come with a helicopter and they'd go up to that lake up there uh, uh, for two reasons. One, one about, the, of course, the fish. But there was always been, they had always tried to find out where the fault was that caused the water to seep down into Theater Falls to create Rattlesnake Lake. Oh, and, okay. Uh, we'll get so, more on that in a minute. So I, I, got, uh, I got taken out of there on a van a couple of times. So, Alan, tell us a little bit about these pictures. Now, you this was your desk where you worked, isn't it? Yeah, this was the desk, and uh, that's the scissors phone there. That was the dispatcher's phone, and you could also plug into another hole, and that would become the block phone. And that, that, that was... Uh, concentrator box there that he's pointing to and you had a, a plug that you could push into any number of holes there. One, one hole was even for the, to activate the telegraph. They, we still had a working telegraph in there. And then uh, the red phone there was a city phone. And uh, when that got put in, uh, Jimmy Irvin, the agent up there, called it the hotline because it was red. And so that was kind of a running joke up there. But. So, so and then the uh, you got the temperature gauge outside there. We, part of our duties was at certain hours, you had to give the train dispatcher the weather and he'd have to write it on his train sheet. And uh, then those lights up there, you can see the red one is lit up and the green one. Uh, we called those the colors and those lights would come on either side uh, when a train was approaching, about five minutes uh, before the train would arrive, the, one of those lights would come on like that red one has there. When that light come on, you would grab the dispatcher's phone and step on the pedal and you'd say, uh, in the colors at Cedar Falls, and then the dispatcher would let you know if he wanted you to copy a train order for him, he'd say 19 West, copy three, and you'd grab your train order pads out of the shelves there and copy an order and hoop it up to them as they went by or he would just say nothing for them and then you just wait until they finally went through and then you would write down the engine number and the time they went by and then you would give the dispatcher what we call the OS and the OS stood for on sheet and you had a sheet of paper that you had this written down on and then you would read it back to the dispatcher at the, the engine number and the direction and the time that it went by your station and then that helped him to keep track of his trains and figure meets ahead of time based on what the progress that these trains were making. Now, now I've got a question for you, Alan, just at the edge of this picture. Yeah, that's my work. Uh, Alan, that box is actually the train order signal. You can just see one half of it there that has a, a button that you can turn three different ways, green, yellow, or red and that would change the signal outside to let the train know if he's gonna have to stop for orders or get orders on the fly or not get orders at all. And then there was another similar one on the other side of the box. But when we, Cedar Falls was no longer a, a, a 24 hour station. You had a weird thing like a, the agent would, was there from eight to four. Then you had a night operator that came on at 8 p.m. at night and stayed till four in the morning. And so you had two four hour gaps that the station was closed. And the Milwaukee had a weird 
rule that when the station was closed, you were supposed to turn the train order signal light off. Now, in the rule books, the absence of a signal where one usually is is a danger signal and you're supposed to stop. So, so the train order signal being light burned out would be a reason to stop and ask the dispatcher what's going on. But anyway, I guess to save power or something, the Milwaukee had this rule where you had to turn the train order signal off when you leave. Well, then you had to remember to turn the dang thing back on when you come on duty. And so I made a little cartoon there that I stuck on there and it said, shut it off, turn it on or something like that. And, and it was a reminder that when you'd come in here, you'd go, oh yeah, I better check the signal because it was real embarrassing when your first train showed up and hollered on the radio that your train or your signal wasn't lit up. You know? <laughs> Yeah, Alan has a secret life as a cartoonist, folks, but we'll get into that at a, a different time. So let's talk about the picture on the right. Who is that? What's going on? That's uh, the second trick or relief operator up there, and his name was Jerry Brett Schneider. And uh, he lives in uh, Iowa right now. He, after the railroad folded up, he ended up as a dispatcher for Burlington Northern and retired out of uh, Fort Worth and uh, then moved up to Iowa. But uh, he was uh, a bit older than me in seniority, about two years, I think. But he, he worked at, he grew up at Cedar Falls because his father was the, the signal maintainer, Andy Brett Schneider. Who are these guys? Okay, the guy in the doorway is Jerry uh, Shively, and he was the section foreman. When I first met him, he was the section foreman on the Everline out of Carnation, but he eventually ended up as the section foreman here at Cedar Falls, and he's still living. He lives over above Spokane somewhere. And then uh, this guy was Al Pizzano, was my neighbor. He lived in the other substation house, the one closest to the substation. And so his family and my family were the last two railroad families to live up there. And then he bought a house in North Bend. So by attrition, I won. I got to be the last railroad family in Cedar Falls. And we uh, don't know the who guy the guy on the bench. I don't know who. Yeah, he is. we can't really tell who he is. It's just uh, he's probably in the witness protection program. Or <laughs> and here we are inside your uh, station, and we could see a better view of your turn it off, turn it on train order signal. Oh yeah, yeah. So that's Jerry Brett Schneider sitting in the chair, and this is Andy Brett Schneider, his dad, that was a signal maintainer, and then this is Jimmy Urban, the agent. And Jimmy's still living up in North Bend, about 90 years old, I think. Yeah, what era do you think this picture would be? This picture, well, it's a Blair Cooster picture, so right. it was probably taken around the, oh, 76, 77 era, I guess. Uh, look, there's, you see the clock above Jim's head there. See the little black square off to the left of it? Right there, yeah. That was a little telegraph key. And uh, at a certain time of the day, they would send a, a pulse, a one second pulse, boom, click, click, and the telegraph over there on the desk would, would click like that. And when it got to a certain point, it would pause, then it would click, and you'd go up there and push that key down, and the clock would go straight up to 12 noon. And so that's how you'd set your standard time. Oh. And that, that Clicking came from the Naval Observatory clear in Washington, D.C. or someplace. They channeled all the way through. Well, knowing what time it is is always an important thing in so the railroad you, so, business. Yeah, and so that was a standard clock, so it had to be accurate. So that was your way of making sure every day it was accurate. And then this beast right in front of Jerry here, that's the teletype machine. And then you can see the tapes hanging off the wall there on the... See those long tapes? Yeah, right there, yeah. Those tapes... When you type, type it out, the, the machine punches holes in the tape, and the tape then, when you feed it through the machine, it deciphers those, those holes and types out your train lists or messages or whatever you want to send on there. And we had to retain those tapes for, I think, like a week or something before we could throw them away in case they needed to have a, a list rerun or something. But. Here's a Blair Coyster picture of a westbound freight approaching uh, Cedar Falls with the bicentennial, Milwaukee Road's bicentennial unit uh, in the picture. The crew's uh, doing their job inspecting the train. 
Yeah, see, I would say this is probably around 1977 or 78 because the bicentennial engine is no longer on the point. It's not the, the uh, shining pride of the fleet anymore. Which would have been 1974, the U.S. bicentennial. So 76. 76, hey, let's yeah. get our facts straight. Yeah. 1974? 1974. 1976. 76 was the bicentennial. We had the bicentennial. I think, I think they painted that engine up about 74 and ran it for about two years before the... So you'll notice the number of DC local, or uh, uh, diesel locomotives on there. There's, I think there's four or five on there. So in, uh, in, the, in the 70s, uh, the uh, Milwaukee uh, was... Uh, looking at upgrading the electrification, but uh, General Electric wanted the Milwaukee to change, uh, change over the whole system, uh, electrification from DC to AC. And so the G General Electric was uh, reluctant to uh, be involved in uh, re re providing parts, building parts for, to keep the DC uh, system running. And the other thing was that General Electric was uh, moving forward with uh, uh, diesel electric locomotives, and they had what were called Jeeps. And uh, so they started putting these Jeeps out on the, on the train. They were uh, like 2,000 horsepower, I think, and there were two, two drivers, uh, traction motors. And uh, they'd come out of Tacoma uh, and they were rated for, uh, I think they were rated for like 500 tons per unit. And so if they had uh, uh, 2,000 tons, then uh, you would figure they'd put four units on it. But they had, uh, they were fi less than 50% reliable, so they had to put six units on there to be able to make it. And I always galled me because we could have done it with the E39, which, with a lot less uh, a lot less drama. But, yeah. but that, it was a big deal there. I, I went through a lot of uh, meetings uh, and, and conversations about that. So, so in this picture, the 161 is on the Everett branch, is that right? Yeah, and they used to uh, use the, what we call number seven track or the back passing. They used to use that a lot for meets. I don't know if the siding was getting so bad that uh, they didn't trust it anymore, but but uh, towards the end years, or the, they would come in that way and do a meet, and then they'll back out and, and use the rest of the siding to get back out onto the main again. Here are some pictures of the depot in its uh, later years. You can see it's getting boarded up now and getting ready to get moved. It actually lives on as a house in Maple Valley, as I recall, right? Yep. Yep. And the guy that owns that house is in the audience here today. Well, there you go. <laughs> but that, that bottom one there, that's the way that most people remember the depot because that's the road into the watershed. So the most public saw the backside of the depot. And here we can see some uh, Cascade Rail Foundations. I think these might actually be Jeff Moreau's. Uh, we can see a picture of the yard uh, looking west uh, with the depot. And you can see the water column there. You can see the water column here. Yeah, we'll, we'll get a little bit closer look at it here. And, and what are all these buildings off to the right here, Alan? Uh, okay, well that first one there, that's the scale house. That's where you weighed the cars. And then the other ones were, for, I believe, for the car department. We had, a, we had a carman up there that did repair work on cars. So I'm going to reach around and you point to me what the back pass is. is this? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's the back passing. Okay. And that it went in, it ultimately came out on the Everett branch, or started the Everett branch. I like this picture so much. Not so much that I like this picture, but I like the picture that follows it. So tell us what's going on here. Okay, <laughs> this, is, this is the Olympian, and he has stopped here to pick up a helper. And so this is the helper getting tied onto the head end. And while they're putting the helper on, they're taking advantage to fill the road unit with water from the water column. You can see the roof of the depot behind the train there and the train order signal. And then uh, that's the uh, oil service tank that that steel tank on top of there had Bunker C oil for the uh, locomotive fuel. 
we got a little better picture of that coming. And then that track on the very edge of the photo, that was called the caboose track. And in this picture, particular picture here, we have a, a portable building on a flat car that they're moving somewhere. So did somebody leave their hat and grip behind here in this picture? Well, it probably belongs to the photographer, I would guess, would be my guess. Way down there beyond the oil tank, you can see a lot of steam coming up, but that's, that's the, also the coal bunkers. You see the roof of them? The coal towers right there, yeah. The, the coal towers that used to be up here in that first picture we saw got moved down to between the legs of the Y in later years. Yeah, it's a very iconic photo, and, and we, can, we can tell from the photo about what year this is. What, about what era is this? Well, it's uh, 19, well, between 1911 and 1912, because the depot was built in 1911, and it's uh, listed as Olympian CM and PS Railway, which is Chicago, Milwaukee, and Puget Sound, and by the end of 1912, the Chicago, Milwaukee, and Puget Sound had been absorbed into the Chicago, Milwaukee, and St. Paul. Okay, so it's interesting how Alan can use these little keys to be able to tell us so much historically about these pictures. And I, should, I mentioned earlier that, at the, that Cedar Falls was a helper point, which it still is, but now we have this huge yard here because they had built a branch line to Enumclaw off of... Uh, the main line about four miles down below Cedar Falls, it was called Bagley Junction, and they built a, a, about an 18-mile branch line to Enumclaw from there, and then they built, in 1911, they built a 54-mile uh, branch line down to Everett. And so now you had two branch lines feeding freight into this Cedar Falls area, so they had to construct this huge yard here to, to handle all that kind of stuff. Here's that oil tank. Explain to us how this worked and what, what some actually, of the environment oil, was. Actually, this oil facility was kind of a genius thing. Uh, it was built so that they only had to have one man operate it. And that's the boiler house there. It had a Scotch Marine boiler in it. And this big concrete sump here held a half a million gallons of bunker sea oil. The bunker sea oil would come in in these tank cars and they would spot them there, and then they'd open the valves, and they had a chute for each car that ran down and emptied the oil into this sump. Then they could pump, they just had one man on duty that could take that boiler house and fire it up, and he could pump that tank up there completely full, and as long as that tank was full by the end of his shift, the trains could come in here, the engines, and they could get oil by gravity flow to a standpipe on the track over there. See the, see the water, uh, tank cars there? Yeah, one of, one of those is the water column and the other one is the oil column there. And uh, so they just had to have a, a one shift guy to run that plant 24 hours a day. It was pretty, uh, pretty ingenious setup. This is what remains of it today is this uh, brick tower is still Buried up there, you'd, you'd have to really search to find it now because the trees are... Well, and you need the permission of the city of Seattle to even go back there, which well, Frank yeah. and I were able to do. Well, so. you can take your chances and go in there, you know. <laughs> so, so, so then, um, <laughs> didn't you have like an aquarium going on inside of this yeah, thing? Yeah, th this thing is also still there, the concrete sump, and the C city of Seattle would like, like it to be gone. It's just, I think they lay awake nights worrying about it, but... but uh, the, the roof rotted off of it or whatever, and uh, it still had bunker sea oil in it, but it also filled up with rainwater. And so every spring it had frogs in it. And I'd be out here checking the yard at night, and this thing, you could hardly hear yourself think the frogs were croaking in there so hard. <laughs> and I don't know, frogs are, are kind of a gauge of being one of the most sensitive animals to changes. So I don't think that bunker oil in there is doing any harm to anything. I didn't see any three-eyed frogs in there or anything, but but yeah, the city. They, they, I've I've gone on a couple of their uh, what they call railroad treasure tours, and they'll take you over and show you this thing, and then they'll talk about their woes on this thing and how they want to get rid of it somehow. 
and then they'll take you for a drive down the right of way for a few miles and back. And I thought, oh yeah, they call it the railroad treasure tour now that the railroad's gone. But when the railroad was here, they hated it. They did not like the railroad going through here at all. Yeah, so just as a note, by the way, uh, we had some time with both Alan and Frank uh, where we did some recordings with them, and you can see those recordings on YouTube. And one of Frank's recordings is standing in front of this tower when we had permission from City of Seattle to be able to actually go back there and, and look at, at what it looks like. It doesn't look like what it used to look like anymore. It's just all trees and bushes at this point. So here we get into some of, the, some of the different pictures. These are some of the Richard Steinheimer photos that we're so lucky to have. And uh, we're what, putting helpers on here, or what are we doing? Any idea, Alan? Yeah, you know, that'd be the helpers over there on the far track. And so they, uh, they may be getting ready to cut the helpers in there. And this is right basically in front of the depot. Uh, that's the platform there. OK. And this one, of course, very famous photograph. Was this taken at the depot, do you think? You know, because you could stand underneath the awning of the depot and shoot a picture of a train in the rain without getting absolutely soaked. Yeah, but they had a kind of a, a platform that extended across several tracks there, and I don't see that here, so no. I don't think that's right across from the depot. Oop. Frank, you got something to add here? Go ahead. Yeah, there's uh, something here that you probably, most, most people don't know anything about, but. Uh, this locomotives here actually have tires. And uh, at one time at Cedar Falls, they had, uh, on, the, on the way, maybe at Black River or maybe uh, uh, some other trip, they had uh, spun the wheels on the track. And so they get, uh, they make flat spots on the track for one thing, but they also wear out the hard steel that's on the outside, and that is the tire. So in order to, to put a tire on that, they, they bring these propane torches up and, and, it, and it burns in a, a ring about the size of the wheel. And they heat that, they heat that uh, tire up and, and then they drive that. They, 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 uh, put, push it on there. They're, they're able to put that on or slide it on there and they drive it on with a sledgehammer uh, this, I saw this done in the middle of the night, so it was very interesting and lots of sparks. <laughs> uh, but it's pretty interesting. And then that tire shrinks when it cools down, and, it, and it's so tight that it, that it can operate like that. Yeah. Uh, Question. They pull, pull the axle out from underneath the engine, or they do that with the, the engine? Yeah, they did that on, this in, on these engines. With the axle intact, I think. Yeah. These are some interesting photos. This is by a fellow named, a, a very famous fellow named Jeff Moreau, April 29th, 1971. These pictures we've, have never been shown before in public. So these are very interesting. And, you know, as interesting as the photos are, Jeff Moreau is, is just worth a, a quick story. So that's not his real name, it's an alias. And so why would a railroad photographer have an alias? And that's because his sister was a movie star. His sister was Stephanie Powers. If anybody ever saw the TV show Heart to Heart, uh, the photographer on this occasion was his brother. Frank, go ahead. This four units right here could take 4,000 tons up, up, the, up to Hayek, up the, up the mountains. And it would pull almost 3,400 amps for almost the whole trip. And, and it could be the, sub, the substation or the generator set, when you started it up, like uh, let, let's say in, uh, in December, the substation might be uh, 30 degrees. By the time we got this train up to uh, Hayek, the substation would be uh, about 90 degrees from the heat that was generated from the. I didn't know that. That's interesting. And, and the other thing I'll tell you, yeah, well, uh, I ran the E39 mostly, E39 and E50. They but, were the last uh, sets. Oh, gosh. Frank, you keep losing your train of thought. 
<laughs> we'll look at this picture by Moreau and it'll anyway, come back it, to you. It was interesting. Yeah, well, it'll come back to us. So, so this would be a city lighthouse over here, Alan? Yeah. Yeah. And so... And um, in that previous picture, you could see a little bit of the uh, work equipment, see the, the uh, snow flangers and the and uh, Jordan spreader, and then uh, that picture on the bottom there, you can see the water car right there, yeah. They had to, they had to maintain a, a water car up there to fight fires if the train started a fire in the, in the uh, watershed up there. Classic Jeff Moreau image of this same train. We're gonna watch this train go across the mountains here in a second. Go ahead, Frank. This, this E-50 locomotive was primarily run in the Rocky Mountains division and, and it was still running when and I ran for it a couple of times uh, it came over to the coast a couple of times for repairs at Tacoma and I ran it uh, ran for it uh, and it was still running when the Milwaukee shut it down and it came online in like 1913 something like that yeah yeah They're, they were impressive I and, mean it's and that very locomotive is in the uh, transportation museum in Duluth in Duluth, Minnesota, where it's going to remain for eternity because they can't get all the other stuff out of the way to pull it out. So, now, a, a engineer friend of mine, he was running one of these box cabs coming down Snoqualmie Pass, and they hit a snow slide, and it broke the window out, and the snow came into the cab and pinned the fireman in his seat. <laughs> and there was nothing they could do for him. They, he was still breathing, so they... They just made their run down to Cedar Falls, and when they got down there, then they could get some help. and they Dig him out. Dug him out. But, <laughs> but he was trapped in his seat under the snow until he got, got down off the hill. And here's another picture of that train. We'll kind of zip through some of these. This just kind of shows them. Well, uh, Frank's got a term for it. Frank, you call that bull cooking, don't you? They're like switching in the yard, I think. And so putting their train together, it looks like. Here's some Blair Coistra pictures. These are a little bit later now. This is an eastbound train. And, and then here's one going by. We could still see the beanery in the background and the Everett branch off here on the left. Another one of these great Blair Coistra photos. These are Richard Steinheimer's. Now, Alan, how did he get, how, did he climb up? How did he get up there to take these pictures? No, he went for a ride on the helper up to Hayek and then on the way back down, he wanted to, get some pictures so they accommodated him and let him off and then they backed up and posed for some pictures for him. Aren't these something folks? Would this be like, was this Garsha or? Uh, yeah, this is up close to Garsha. I think that's the whole Creek Bridge. Okay. Yeah, just fabulous stuff. Very grateful for CRPA letting us be able to share this with our audience today. And then now that's kind of a, why do we have this big retaining wall here and this really cool bridge? Could you tell us a little bit about this, Alan? Okay, well, this is, this is McClellan's Butte. And uh, the story goes that uh, the contractor up here that was building the roadbed set a huge dynamite charge, like uh, 25 kegs of black powder and a couple of tons of dynamite sticks all drilled into this rock to blast it off to make a roadbed out of it. And they set it off with one shot. And the back of the photograph I have says that it shook Seattle and they thought it was an earthquake, but I don't know if, I don't know if it, that's true or not. But what is true is they used too much dynamite and they literally blew the entire side of the mountain off. So they had to rebuild a roadbed out of concrete. And so that's what you're seeing here is this retaining wall for a concrete roadbed and then there's a 50-foot concrete arch in the middle of it that probably most bicyclers and hikers that use this trail today probably don't even know that's there because there's no clue unless you walk down over the edge and see it but to get that photo there's a a, a pole up there one of the, one of the high transmission poles and in order to put a, a, a guy on there, they put another pole across and then ran the guy down to it that way to, to, to stabilize it. So what, what I did, I walked out on that, on that pole, and when I got the camera up to my eyes, I started to lose my balance. So 
I had to snap that picture really quick. And I'm surprised it came out as clear as it did. But that's so, a great shot. So there's another yes, thing. There's another thing that was very important up here, and they were called rock, rock fences, or slide fences. Yeah. And they were hooked up to the signal circuits, and so that if the gravel came down or rocks came down, it would turn the block signal uh, to red, which the train has to stop. It, the train can, after a certain amount of time, can proceed again, uh, but only at speeds that he can stop before running into another train or run into this thing. So those slide fences were uh, the uh, lifesavers at road least. crews and, uh, and the signal crew. And they had to go out there and they had to clear that all that off there for that train. It was really hard work and, and it could be at any time in a 24 hour period. Any time. Here we have a picture of uh, the Hayak substation. Yes, <laughs> and uh, we're gonna, we're gonna d dive into this a little bit deeper here, next photo. Now, the best part about this picture is you guys know who that truck belonged to, don't you? Who, whose truck was that, Frank? <laughs> Well, that had to be around 69. Uh, actually, these are 71, April 71. What? Yeah, April 29th, 71 are the dates on the pictures. 71, okay. Yeah, so pretty close. Yeah, because that's the relief operator's pickup. And uh, you know, that's we, how I know that. But yeah, we used to have a, a lot of problems there. Uh, people would love to get their fo take photographs uh, uh, of the substation and they'd like to get up, you know, put their friends or they put their wife up against the wall, you know, and I take the pictures and all these stalactites hanging down there. <laughs> but, oh, uh, yeah. And we had a terrible time because uh, especially if the substation would run and if the, you ran the substation, like for this train here, it would heat up the ceiling and the snow would slide off and the stalactites would fall down to the ground. It was pretty dangerous. It was hard to keep people out of there. But the snow sometimes would be, you'd have to slide into that door. That, uh, yeah, that office door, you'd have to almost slide it to get into it. That's how high it could, snow could be. Well, and you look and see how high that foundation sits, you know, and, and this is a picture taken in late April, and you look at all the snow up there at this point in time. The other thing about this station here that you can see, the, you can see those insulators, those three insulators sticking down there. Well, that's because they're, they're taking the 115,000 volts through the substation. Whereas the pictures you saw of Cedar Falls, the, the, the wiring came from the outside uh, and just operated the substation. But this is transported right through the substation. And that could be very complicated at times uh, during electrical times because you, electricity doesn't go through the wire. The wire is just a conductor and the electricity is in a corona or like a, like a donut over a wire. And, and uh, depending on the size of the charge gives you the idea of the outside diameter of the donut. So if you have a power surge that's really, really close to you like they had at Renton at one time, then that donut could be, let's say, uh, uh, two feet in diameter. And the hole going through there is only four inches. So how are you gonna get that How's, electric, how's that lightning going to get through that hole? To go, because it wants to go to ground. So it blows a hole in the brick wall. Whoa. <laughs> Three foot diameter hole at Renton. Hmm. So here, let's watch this train come up the hill. This is just coming out of the tunnel at uh, Hayek eastbound heading for Clay Ellum. So, yes. operation wise. So the train just came out of the tunnel. So the operator, Bill Bibby, was his name, at Hayek, he would text, he would, he would uh, call text. me right away, ring, 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 and he, hey, Frank, he's coming out of the hole. So, okay, so then I shut down, and I can maybe go home, <laughs> or, uh, or Sleep clean Sleep in up. your camper or uh, something? I might have to clean up uh, a mess. There's always a mess at Cedar Falls. But uh, so then uh, the other thing Bill would do, he would automatically start the substation at Cleelum because at that time uh, Cleelum became an automated station. And then uh, 
Uh, Bill was always one who was pretty quick to get out of there, so what, if the train was pretty close to Cleo, I mean, he would shut down all, shut everything down, and he, he lived in Renton, so he'd just drive home. <laughs> and here we see this train coming through here. We'll kind of slip through here. Now, Frank, you told me a story about these uh, transmission lines and the snow plows. What happened there? So, uh, the snow plow, uh, Cecil Gearhart would be on what was called the cut widener, and that was like a, uh, maybe a bulldozer, it looked like a bulldozer with, a, instead of a straight blade, it had a V blade like this, and it, and it pushed the snow over to the side, and, uh, and it quite often went in conjunction with a rotary. So the, rot the rotary was uh, 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 a diesel engine, or it could be an electric engine that uh, would throw this snow like this and, and way up onto the bank. And where at Hayek, uh, the traveling engineer, Wayne Ferrier, uh, he'd always get pretty exuberant coming out of the tunnel to make that really nice looking snow bank. <coughs> so he'd shoot that snow up there to beat, hell, to beat heck. Okay. And he would hit way over in the corner here, you can see the 115,000 volts. So that's three wires, that's three phase. And so it might, the snow would go up there and maybe slap those wires together and trip out everybody. A whole Hayek would go black, Easton would go black. Uh, and then- Frank's so scrambling, driving to, up there, figuring out who, what's going on. So who has to go fix it? Yeah. yeah, so Frank gets called and says, hey Frank, you gotta go up there. Well, the pass is closed. He says, well, see if you can get up there. <laughs> Yeah, so anyway, I would drive up there. Sometimes that where you see the snow shed now, I get whacked with a little snow slide, but so then I'd go up there and re-energize the oil circuit breaker so the community could have power. So here that train that Jeff Moreau has been following, we saw it uh, is now coming into Clay Ellum, and this is uh, now Cascade Rail Foundation's uh, heritage site, which we operate as a partnership with Washington State Parks. So we'll just take a quick look at a couple of pictures of the train here arriving. And uh, this was a crew change point, so we're gonna see the old crew get off and the new crew get on. So this was an important spot from the standpoint of work hours. You're all, uh, at one time, uh, trail train crews uh, were re weren't required to work any more than 16 hours, and then they had to be relieved. And then they changed that to 12 hours. And so Cleelum here was a halfway point between Tacoma and Othello. And so the train crews had to be uh, replaced. And uh, if the train crew, uh, say, was at Hayek and they had their 12 hours of service was up, they had to shut the train down. And somebody like me would have to go up there in an in a international travel hall and pick that crew up and take them to Cleelum and bring a fresh crew from Cleelum to put them on that train and, and get a load of this. So the conductor that was on that train, he is paid until the caboose gets to the location of that train. Oh, yeah. <laughs> These are a couple of pictures by a very, very famous Canadian photographer, Doug Cummings. And I'm very grateful that we had the opportunity to look at these. You know, we see this, this is that modified box cab. It's a little bit more customized on the front. And you can see also that uh, he's going pretty good clip, isn't he, Alan? He looks like he's got a little brake smoke flying, doesn't he? Yeah, he come down the hill plenty hot. Yeah, coming down a little hot. So now we'll get into some of these vintage pictures from around this area. These are from the Walt Ainsworth collection at the uh, Pacific Northwest Railroad Archive. And this is, where are we, Alan? Oh, we're right here in good old Maple Valley. We're yes. right here in good old Maple Valley, ladies and gentlemen. That, that yeah. was the second depot at Maple Valley. I have a photo over in my photo album of the original Borden Batten building that was there. This was built after the Milwaukee connected up to the Pacific Coast Railroad with their Pacific Extension. And uh, <clears throat> this was a joint depot between the Milwaukee and the Pacific Coast Railroad. So the Milwaukee, I think, paid for it. And it's built to a Milwaukee standard uh, design. Okay, so this uh, bipolar locomotive is like a caterpillar. 
You can see caterpillars got a million legs, looks like a million legs, to, to manipulate. So every one of the axles on this locomotive is wound electric motor on the axle. And when the passenger service was shut down for lack of, because of the construction of the, of the highways, uh, then they tried to use these locomotives for freight, but they were geared too high. And they couldn't, they would just spin the wheels. They couldn't uh, gear low enough to uh, develop uh, a bite or traction to be able to move a hundred ton of, of freight or something like that. So, so they ended up just scrapping them. I think that maybe one's preserved in maybe St. Louis, Missouri or something. So. They, they were very fast engines though because the engineers would make a bet with the brakeman that He'd stand at the front of that engine and he'd start out and he wouldn't be able to grab the, the, the ladder on the other end of it. And, he, and most times they couldn't, it was going too fast. And if they were coming out of the hole, so Cedar Falls had a passing track. That was, the passing track was right next to the substation and then you had the main line. And so the conductor that would be on here, uh, or the rule is when the train pulls out of the, out of the siding and then it gets on the main line that the conductor is to line the, the switch back to the main. You can't leave a switch lined up to a siding. And so uh, the conductor would come into the substation and he says, hey, highball the gate for me when I hit the big iron. Oh, what's that mean? <laughs> <laughs> so, that, so I would then go out there so that the train could uh, maintain uh, movement forward without stopping so this this person could go out and line the switch because if he lined the switch, he can catch up with the train. And so I'd go out there and line the switch for him. <laughs> the vintage shot here in downtown Maple Valley. A couple more photos. We're almost done, folks. But this one, this running shot along the Maple Valley Highway, I mean, that's iconic picture with the crew and somebody sitting in the back seat, uh, pacing shot. You know, I just needed to throw that in there. Another picture with the Maple Valley, the new Maple Valley. The new depot. Depot yeah. from the Burlington Northern era. A couple more famous pictures. I want to say the bottom one is by John Hill because he always liked, he was like me. He always liked putting his kids in the picture. That could be one of our kids. <laughs> and then this one. Now tomorrow, if anybody's around, uh, Frank and I are going to be back at the Renton History Museum in downtown Renton. And uh, it used to be a fire station. And then this picture here in the, in the bottom is now the junction of the Maple Valley Highway and uh, 405 would be uh, going right through that picture now. So a few more, these are Renton pictures in downtown Renton along, uh, oh gosh, what is that, uh, Hauser? Hauser Way. Hauser Way, yeah, right, running right down the street, iconic. That's where I saw my first electric uh, Milwaukee train it was on Hauser Way. I was lost down there and I was driving down there at night and I saw a headlight coming at me and realized it was a train. And my wife was freaking out because I was playing chicken with it and then I finally got out of its way and it had a set of uh, box cab motors on it. So, so just as a, as a marketing note, for those of you that haven't gotten your copy of the Pacific Coast book, isn't this picture in the Pacific Coast book, Dick? Yeah, I think so too. That's a great shot, you know. Uh, that's a spring switch. That's what the SS stands for there. It's a switch that you didn't have to line. You could just drive out of it and it would automatically close. So you know what this car, you know what this car is called? You probably call it a caboose. It's called a crummy. A crummy. On the railroad, it's a crummy. Yeah, on a crummy, yeah. Pacific Coast going by a steam engine, going by a set of uh, box cabs in downtown Renton. Just great stuff. Great stuff. We're coming to the end here. A couple more, and we're gonna. Here's a couple more Doug Cummings pictures of uh, in color. We saw that train going through Cedar Falls. Now we see it again. And the best part of this picture, of course, is this guy with his camper, thinking that he can. Just, oh, I think we can squeeze through there. You know, I think they survived. You know, this uh, this beautiful sort of modified um, box cab set. And we're into the credits now. So our presentation today was uh, Electrifying Tales of Cedar Falls, Cascade Rail Foundation, and the Pacific Northwest Railroad Archive. 
with our special guests, Frank and Alan, the, our, our guys. And I wanted to, this was, to me, one of the best parts of the whole presentation is I was able to get photographs of the photographers that contributed their images to our uh, presentation today. Richard Steinheimer, uh, courtesy of the Center for Railroad Photography and Art in Madison, Wisconsin, a world famous photographer, one of the greats of the 20th century. And, and then Blair Koistra, and I, we like this one so much because we see Blair back in the day when he was actually taking pictures there, and we see Blair now today who is a BNSF dispatcher in Fort Worth, Texas, and he's up there walking the trail, holding a picture of himself walking along the main line back in the day. Just great stuff. And, and this is the one that I said, because this is a picture of Jeff Moreau, and these are really hard to come by. And I thought, well, if I've got Jeff Moreau, I could get the rest of these people. And so uh, Jeff Moreau, his ashes are sp spread at the Orange Empire Railroad Museum in Paris, California, because he was a traction guy. He liked these electric locomotives. And finally, Doug Cummings. Uh, Doug, a very famous photographer from uh, Vancouver, British Columbia area. Uh, very grateful to Dale Sanders of White River Productions and to the Cummings family for providing these images and letting us enjoy these images today. I want to thank our partners, uh, Maple Valley Historical, Dick Peacock, uh, Mark from uh, Maple Valley Community Center, Renton Historical tomorrow, the Center for Railroad Photography and Art, Cedar Falls Watershed, they let Frank and I go in there on a tour and shoot some video. Washington State Historical Society, they contributed a number of images to our program and Washington State Parks, our partner with Cascade Rail Foundation at South Clay Ellum. And a special help to Aaron Rose of CRPA for the help with the Steinheimer images, that was a big deal. Uh, the, the important thing now is the credits. Joshua Wurzma, who's back there on the, um, on the control panel, our, our videographer extraordinaire. And we've got a ton of this stuff, more interviews with these guys on YouTube. Josh shot all that stuff for us too. Craig Thorpe worked on it, Aaron's worked on it, Robert Scott worked on it, Virginia Wright, executive director of the Pacific Northwest Railroad Archive, did all of the artwork for this and I was the guy that had this idea that we needed to do this. So I want to thank everybody for watching and please, please support your local historical or association. Well, I hope everybody enjoyed today's program and let's give our special guests a big round of applause for being here.